Hi, I'm Margot Atwell. I'm one of the publishing outreach leads at Kickstarter, uh, and I'm here at Kickstarter headquarters with John Joseph Adams. Um, we're going to be hanging out, talking about some of his projects and how he's used the site today. Um, so John Joseph Adams, if you're not aware, is the series editor of Best American Science Fiction and Fantasy. Uh, and he's also edited more than two dozen other anthologies, including bestsellers like Wastelands and The Living Dead and uh, Help Fund My Roadbot Army, which he funded on Kickstarter. Um, he also edits the digital magazines Nightmare, which was funded on Kickstarter, and the two-time Hugo award-winning Lightspeed. Uh, he's also run four projects on Kickstarter, um, the Nightmare Magazine one, uh, Help Fund My Robot Army, Women Destroy Science Fiction, and Queers Destroy Science Fiction. Hello, thanks for having me. Welcome. This Go ahead. Hmm. Right. Um, so thanks for being with us here today. Uh, I'm going to ask you a couple questions, and then we'll be taking questions either on the Google Hangout page or uh, tweeting. People can tweet them at, at Kickstarter tips. Um, so hopefully we'll have some questions from the audience as we go along. Um, so I guess the first question is, um, what made you decide to run your first project? Uh, well, you know, I was already doing Lightspeed Magazine, and um, I uh, I had been getting a lot of uh, darker uh, fiction, so uh, dark fantasy and horror, and I was getting so much that um, if I had published it all, uh, it would have dra drastically changed the sort of tone of what Lightspeed was, and I wanted Lightspeed to be a general interest uh, science fiction fantasy magazine, not one with a specifically dark focus. So, um, and I, and I mean, I had done some work in the horror genre before. So, you know, I'd done The Living Dead and, and you know, um, I'd done uh, By Blood We Live, which is a vampire anthology. And then of course, I've done several uh, apocalypse anthologies um, and, and a lot of people consider that horror. So, um, you know, so I, and I'd wanted to do more horror. And uh, so I, I, I decided I wanted to try to, to launch Nightmare, um, but I figured, well, I'd seen Kickstarters and I'd seen a lot of people do successful publishing Kickstarters. And so um, I thought, well, you know, we have Lightspeed that's successful already, but, um, you know, uh, I wanted to make sure that there was enough of a market out there for a horror magazine like this, because I mean, there hadn't really been a new one in, in quite a long time, it seemed like, and, and there had been some that had sort of started up and then fizzled out and, and all that kind of thing. So um, I wanted to make sure that we had a good solid footing um, to, to launch the magazine before we, uh, you know, before we did it, which I mean, of course, I mean, that's the whole point of Kickstarter, really. So, um, you know, uh, so yeah, so we did that, and you know, it was successful, and um, you know, and so it, it allowed us to launch with some subscribers and um, some individual issue sales for the first issue, so that we sort of had that basis to begin with, rather than just starting from zero at, at issue one um, and then having to build from there. So it, you know, it, it gave us a great kickstart, you know. Yeah, well, great. Um, so you've raised well over $100,000 with four different projects. Um, what do you think has made these projects so successful? Uh, well, I think it was definitely different in each one. Um, for uh, for Help Fund My Robot Army, um, that one, uh, the, the full title is Help Fund My Robot Army and Other Improbable Crowdfunding Projects. Um, so with that one, it's like, okay, well, I mean, obviously if people like Kickstarter, then an anthology uh, you know, uh, an anthology launched via Kickstarter about fictional Kickstarters, that just seems like it's kind of perfect. And so, like, you know, I, I, I actually kind of thought that one might do a little bit better than it did. But, I mean, I was perfectly happy with where it ended up. I mean, it obviously it, it raised much more than we were asking for initially. So um, so I was happy enough with that. But um, uh, with the – but the, the, the other – the, the the two big successful ones that we did were the two destroy science fiction ones, the women destroy science fiction and queers destroy science fiction. Um, and so, I mean, I think those uh, did really well mainly because, you know, it was, they were about these sort of issues that, um, that really resonated with a lot of people and um, and a lot of people saw it as something that was sort of correcting this, uh, this sort of wrong that had been done to a, you know, large, you know, segment of the readership and, and you know, just, the human race, um, you know, and so, uh, you know, because uh, Women Destroy Science Fiction started with um, with the uh, just 
the, the preponderance of reviews that uh, of of people saying that like women were destroying science fiction with you know with their girl cooties essentially you know it's like oh you know I don't want to read science fiction with uh, with those types of elements in it or whatever you know and um, and it sort of just reached a boiling point with this one review and a bunch of people online just were very upset with it and you were just annoyed by the, the sort of ignorance of it and um, and so it and so my wife uh, Christy Ant, who went on to um, to guess at the issue, she she just said on Twitter one morning like so, hey ladies, who I'm up for destroying science fiction today? Who's who's with me or, or something like that? Um, and so um, and there was this, this huge rallying cry like behind that. Um, and so we just said, oh well, hey, maybe we should do a special issue. You know, I mean, um, and you know, turn it over completely to women creators. So like I'll I'll get out of the way and I'll I'll let somebody else guess that at the issue and we'll have all women writers in the issue and uh, and we did that and so. So that project just really took off, and um, and and just because I think so many people were like, yeah, like that's a ridiculous idea that women can't write science fiction. I mean, and like look at all these women that have done it already. I mean, science fiction was essentially founded by women. I mean, Mary Shelley wrote Frankenstein, um, and that's considered by many people to be the first like real science fiction novel because if you take the science scientific elements out of that story, it just completely falls apart. It's like it, it, that's what it's entirely about. I mean. Um, uh, people probably think of it more as a horror novel because it has those scary elements and it's got the monster, but but it's created with science, you know, and so um, so so it's kind of seen as like the sort of um, the 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 first true science fiction novel, um, but um, but you know, so uh, I mean, I think you know, people just. Uh, they were sort of crying out for that kind of thing and nobody had uh, filled that void. I mean, you know, people have done um, other kinds of, um, you know, all women um, science fiction anthologies and such like that, but there hadn't been anything like that in quite a while, it seemed like. And um, and also I don't think like, and, and we did it in this sort of, uh, sort of almost like sarcastic way where we were, you know, we, we just took the term and threw it right back. So it's like, you know, women are destroying science fiction. Okay, well, we're gonna ask, so we're gonna turn it over to women and say, okay, Destroy science fiction, you know, and what is and and let, allow people to interpret that as they see fit, and uh, and then so since that one was so successful, we decided okay, well let's let some other um, groups destroy science fiction, and um and then we decided to do queers destroy as the second one, um largely uh, inspired by you know the same sorts of things, and like uh, for for my for my point uh, my point of view, I, I just published this anthology at the end of Znai, um, which is an apocalypse anthology, um, and a bunch of the reviews on Amazon were like complaining about the queer content in it. And it's like, it was like there was, I think there's 23 stories in there, something like that. Literally, like five of the stories had queer like characters or protagonists in them, um, and only one of them was actually like an issue story or anything. It's like that one was actually about uh, gay marriage, um, sort of in the wake of an uh, apocalypse. Um, the other ones just had gay characters in them. They just they just had the temerity to have gay characters exist in their world. Um, and that's just like you know, this just just ruined it for these people that and that they that they so much so that they felt compelled to go to Amazon to rant about it, you know. Um, and so it's like, okay, well, no, that 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 kind of I see that happen all the time. And it's like, like no, the existence of gay people doesn't like that doesn't do anything to you. And, and it's like, it's like that's just reflecting the world as it exists. There are gay people. You can't like just like you can't just write stories and just not have them in there. That's ridiculous. And so, um, so so yeah. I mean, that was one of the the inspirations for that. And I and, and I mean, again, I think um, people were sort of hungry for that kind of thing to be done. And um, so um, hopefully, I mean, I would love it for for projects like that to not be necessary, but it still feels like they are. Um, and uh, you know. Um, so, so we're doing uh, People of Color Destroy Science Fiction next year. Um, we're going to launch that Kickstarter in January. And uh, so, and, and honestly, like, there's so much work. Like, I kind of hope, like, okay, let's, 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 let's have this be the last one, I hope. You know, um, but um, there, there's, you know, there's always some kind of stupidity happening out there that it seems like there's, um, you know, reason to do something or other like this to, to sort of fight back against it. But, um, and I think it's like, it's a way for us to, to fight back against that kind of attitude without being too like, um, sort of attacking of, of anybody in particular. It's just like, okay, well, um, to anybody who, who thinks that women are destroying science fiction or whatever, it's like, okay, well here, we're gonna do this awesome thing and use it as a rallying cry. And if you don't like it, fine, but we're not actually specifically attacking those people, you know? So it's like, it's a way to do it without being too sort of confrontational, um, but probably more effective anyway. Uh, what were some of the responses to to those projects when they were live um, and and to the anthology since they've come out? 
or I'm sorry, to these special issues. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, the there was lots of great uh, responses um, to to the projects when they were going on. Like, uh, uh, you know, just so many comments from people who backed it, just uh, you know, saying how that that you know that idea really resonated with them, and that you know, and and well, one of the biggest things was seeing in the submissions that we got for the issues was all of these people who were saying like like I mean with the women one especially all the, there were all these women who were just like you know what I I never thought that um I would write science fiction like they they were they wrote fantasy but they didn't write science fiction and they were like but this inspired me to try it and it's like and and we thought like that well that was a victory just in and of itself and it's like if that's all that the project had done then that would have been great because it's like the thing is it's like a lot of people have this weird idea about science fiction that like you need to have like a degree in physics or whatever like you need to understand all of this complicated science but it's like it's not true I mean there's so much science fiction that has low science uh, content and you can talk around a lot of it um, and it doesn't take that much research to actually make a story that works without getting into the nitty-gritty of the details um, and and then of course there's things where like the science is like sort of a social science so like I mean or like dystopian fiction it's like there's not much science like hard science in that it's just about you know imagining how terrible things could go wrong or like post-apocalyptic fiction it's like well there's not much science in that it's like I mean except for like whatever caused the apocalypse and then at that point it's like it's it's not even really um, it doesn't really have much into it but um, but so, so there was those. There was all those kinds of responses of people saying like, "Oh, well, they're actually writing science fiction for the first time," and so I mean, so that was really great. But, um, but you know, yeah, just a lot of readers just like really, uh, just really resonated with them. And then, um, like critically, um, like NPR named "Women Destroy Science Fiction" one of the best books of the year. So I mean, like that was crazy. That was awesome. Yeah. Um, and uh, and yeah, and like and so and "Women Destroy Science Fiction" is actually nominated for the British Fantasy Award. Um, uh, so, so that's pretty cool too. Um, and, uh, yeah, so, I mean, yeah, it's just generally, um, the, the response to all of them has just been really fantastic. Um, you know, Queer's Destroy Science Fiction came out in June, so, it, um, you know, uh, it's too early for it to have any sort of those sort of, uh, annual accolades, but, um, but I mean, the, the response has been similarly good. Um, um, although, um, uh, one review site uh, sort of did a review specifically like attacking it essentially um, or, or mocking it. And so I was like, okay, well, that 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 reflects more on you than on us. So uh, one of the things I loved about the Queers Destroy Science Fiction project was how you used updates. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about that? Oh, sure. Uh, yeah, you know, so uh, one of the challenges when you're doing a Kickstarter, I think, is always um, trying to figure out how to stay engaged with the audience um, and potential audience uh, throughout the process without being too, like, you know, just, like, hammering it over and over, like, hey, I'm doing a Kickstarter. Hey, I'm doing a Kickstarter, you know? Um, it's like, so we wanted to have content provided uh, through the updates throughout the, prog throughout the project so that it gave us an excuse to talk about it every day without being sort of naggy about it. Like, you know, we're not, we're not nagging you to go pledge, but like, Hey, just go look at this thing. And so, um, we did these personal essays. Um, and so, uh, and we did this for women destroy science fiction as well, <clears throat> but we, um, we basically, so we basically, so the, we had the project, uh, scheduled to run for about 30 days. So we tried to get like 30 different people, uh, you know, science fiction, fantasy readers and writers um, to just sort of write about their experience um, as that group. So like, you know, the women writing as women or the queer people writing as queer people um, engaging with science fiction um, and what it's been like for them um, to, to have encountered these kind, kinds of uh, sort of pushback or these prejudices of, of that, like, oh no, you can't do that. You, you can't you're not equipped to write that or, or whatever or you know you can't you can't um have your kind of you can't have people like you reflected in these stories you know um so it's like uh so we tried to get people to write about those experiences um and the hope was besides the fact that you know we we were trying to do it to get people um you know at, we're trying to do it as an excuse to get people to actually go see the site whereas maybe they wouldn't otherwise uh, but we we're also hoping that anybody who did have those sort of negative views towards these things might see those personal stories and maybe stop and think about it and um you know maybe maybe change their mind i mean of course that's what we hope fiction will do as well uh because i think when you have um one of the great things fiction can do is make you stop and think about something in a different way that just telling you cold facts can't do uh, because you know you're inside the person's head you're seeing all of their emotions and 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 seeing what they have to go through um, and so hopefully the fiction can help do that as well but I mean I think in um, in this case um, you know getting 
getting those people who had these negative views towards these subjects to even read the issue would be a challenge. So that's one of the ways that we hope that the personal essays might be able to draw them in because if they click through or, you know, I don't know if somebody was talking about how great it was and they just happened to click through and then they realize what it is, maybe they stop reading, but maybe, maybe they won't. Maybe they'll get, you know, drawn into that person's story and, and, and maybe, you know, develop some empathy for, for that situation. So, um, so yeah, and then we ended up putting those essays in the issue as well. Oh. Um, yeah, and so uh, I mean that made it a lot lot larger. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's like okay, it's like one of the challenges is to like, keep the size down of this thing so that it's not like too gigantic. But uh, yeah, I mean because like both of the the destroy science fiction volumes are just like huge, huge volumes. I mean they're like there's like the size of one of my larger anthologies. So um, I mean like a, like a hundred fifty thousand words or so, which is uh, I don't know it's about four hundred something pages in trade paperback. Um, you know so. Um, but yeah, I mean, so yeah, at first we were just going to have those uh, on the Kickstarter page. Um, but then like by the time we finished the end of, of Women Destroy Science Fiction, it just seemed like the essays were such a part of the process that it would have felt wrong to not include them in the in the issue, um, in, in, you know, in the print issue, in an ebook issue. And so, um, so we decided to put them in there. And so that's just become part of the thing that we do. Um, and then so... You know, both uh, both projects um, unlocked stretch goals uh, to so 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 both of the special issues were specifically for science fiction, and so um, both of them unlocked stretch goals for uh, for destroying horror and destroying uh, fantasy as well. And so, and then we had separate uh, guest uh, destroyers uh, mm -hmm. editing those volumes and writing for those volumes, and so um, uh, and so those are on the smaller side because. Uh, uh, just because of the way we have uh, the different magazines structured, but um, uh, so all three of the women issues are out. Uh, the Queers of Choice Science Fiction is out now. Queers of Choice Horror comes out um, in like a week, um, and then Queers of Choice Fantasy comes out in uh, December. So. Uh, so yeah, that's all in progress, and uh, I'm very excited actually about Queers of Joy Horror. We got an original Chuck Palahniuk story, wow. so that's pretty cool. That's fantastic. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and it's funny. It's like uh, I I thought that it was pretty well known at this point that he was queer, but I, a lot of people don't know. So I mean, I think that's cool too. And and I mean, you know, and just having him on board um, will obviously draw a lot more attention to uh, the issue when it comes out. Um, and uh, and yeah, it was just really cool to be able to work with him. I I've been I've been after him to try to write me a story for years, and I've never been able to get him to. Um, and I mean, and this one this wasn't even me. I mean, I get to publish it, but I don't get to get credit for it. Um, but. Uh, yeah, like like guts is one of my favorite stories, um, and uh, and and it really bummed me out when I I couldn't reprint it in Nightmare because it was like their rights were tied up. But it's like ah, oh, such you know. Anyway, <laughs> that's another story. <laughs> um, so you mentioned that you're already uh, thinking about or planning um, people of color destroy science fiction. Mm -hmm. um, so what's your process when you start working on a Kickstarter project, and how long do you tend to work on them before <laughs> you launch them? Uh, well, it seems like they, the, the work never stops on one, you know, I mean, it's like, oh my goodness, like, uh, uh, just the thought of even, um, once we, like the month, like the sort of month leading up to the launch and then the month of the project, it's like, I don't even want to think about it. Cause it's like, it's so much work. And it's just like every day I would get up and I would, I would sit down at the computer and be like, okay, well I'll do, I'll deal with some of this stuff and then I'll get to my other work. And it's like, nope. Just like all day, you know, dealing with Kickstarter stuff, you know, it's like it's it's like it takes it takes a lot of tending, you know, to, to make one uh, work well. And so, um, but uh, so can you, can you talk a little bit about the types of things you do while your campaign is live? Sorry, I'm asking yeah. different questions here, but that sure, sure. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, well, I mean, we have we have to get the um, you know the essay posted, whichever essay we have posted that day. But then there's also just you know trying to get on social media to see if people are talking about it and see what what ways we can sort of help get the word out. Trying to uh, just sort of uh, do some publicity behind the scenes to see if we can you know reach out to uh, you know just sort of media outlets to see if they can cover it, you know, and and that kind of thing, and. You know, like it, if <laughs> I, I wouldn't even say that it doesn't seem like it's that much, but somehow I spend all day doing it or something. It's like it's crazy. I mean, or at least like half the day, you know, and it's like, um, you know, part of it's just like I think like um, uh, maybe not being as well prepared for it by the time that I need all this stuff to be lined up. Uh, and, you know, that's on me. But, um, you know, the thing is, like, there's so many working 
well, so, so many moving parts on something like this that it can get very overwhelming because like you know it's like okay well you know it's like oh well hey we got we got our stretch goals and then people are asking all of these questions because this thing wasn't clear or that thing wasn't clear and then like well we got to get some graphics in there for the stretch goals and to, to illustrate the stretch goals or just to have section headings and it's like and so I got to rely on all these other people to do all these other things and um, yeah I don't know it's a it just seems like it seems like it always takes over my life when I do one but um, it, in retrospect, it doesn't seem like it should. Like it's like, well, it doesn't seem like it's that much, but I don't know. It always takes up a lot of time. Um, and sort of in the months leading up to it, it's like right now, um, you know, we lined up our guest editor for people of color to destroy science fiction. And so um, we asked Nalo Hopkinson, um, who's a you know um, a well-known uh, science fiction fantasy writer, um, and she's edited several anthologies. And uh, she actually wanted to. Um, work with a younger uh, editor as well to sort of be like a mentor. So, so like, you know, she, she, um, she would be the sort of the, the lead name and then she wanted to bring on somebody to co-edit it with. So, so it's going to be Nalo Hopkinson and Christine on Muslim. Um, and so, uh, so the two of them are going to guess at it together. And then we haven't figured out all of our, um, our subsection editors yet. So like the reprint editor and, and nonfiction editor and all that, but, um, but they're going to be the lead, uh, guest editors. So they're going to be picking all the original fiction and sort of overseeing, um, the issue as a whole. Um, and so, uh, and so, so we did that, we lined them up. And then, so now like what we're trying to do is trying to figure out who all the other people are going to be to work on the issue. Cause it's like, you know, like for women destroy science fiction, I know it was like, it was like 115 different people worked on the issue. Like in terms of like, including the writers, the people who wrote the essays, all the different um, editorial staff, uh, you know, proofreaders, um, all that kind of stuff. And so, um, you know, uh, I, I didn't I didn't do an account like that for Queers Destroyed, but I'm sure it's similar, and I expect it's going to be similar for this one as well. And so, um, you know, it's a lot of a lot of moving pieces. Yeah. Uh, so, with a project like Queers Destroy Science Fiction or Women Destroy Science Fiction, mm -hmm. do you find that that is um, a different experience than something that's like an anthology that you're doing? Is there a different scale to it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it definitely seems like it. I mean, and and um, the thing is, like uh, the, the the two destroy ones, uh, the two destroy projects I ran, those were the two most recent ones I ran. So I also had the experience of having launched Nightmare, and then I I had the experience of doing the the Help on My Robot Army anthology Kickstarter. Um, so I mean, you know, I'm learning as I go. Um, but then also, um, I think it was uh, it was a little bit more challenging to figure out ways to. Um, to, to sort of keep the conversation going with those other two projects, whereas this one, I think we really nailed it with the whole personal essays thing. Like with uh, with Help on My Robot Army, um, I ended up doing these interviews with the contributors because I had lined up like however many contributors, um, and uh, and so I just did some little interviews with them um, sort of while the campaign was going on, so that people could sort of get to know who these writers are that are going to be writing stories for the book and and that kind of thing. Um, but uh, but yeah, I mean, with um, with something like the Destroy Projects, I think it's just it's just naturally uh, easier to engage with the audience because it's about something larger than just like a cool theme. You know, it's like about something that feels important to people. Um, and whereas, like, as cool as I think Help on My Robot, uh, Help on My Robot Army is, it's like you know, a book about a book funded on Kickstarter about fictional Kickstarter projects. It's like it's just kind of weird and meta and clever, but it's not like going to change the world. You know, so whereas like, you know, the destroy projects, actually, they can have a positive effect on on things. So um, so I think that's that made it a lot easier to engage uh, with the audience. And uh, um, so and I think that's a large part of why it was, you know, they were so much more successful than the, than the other things. So. Um, so you're a judge for the National Book Award in the uh, young people's literature category. Mm -hmm. And uh, I imagine you've read quite a lot of young people's literature now. Um, yeah. Are there new voices you're excited about or trends you're seeing that, that are exciting to you? Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, you know, I wasn't familiar with most of the writers that uh, that we, you know, that we were considering for the award, and and I mean, and and the top ten has been announced now, and and so you can see um, what uh, what me and the other panelists uh, ended up deciding on, um, and there are books on there that I just like really, really love, like, um, and I mean, they're all all of the top ten are great, but and, and and there's even ones that I really love that didn't make it in the top ten, you know, so it's like so the the breadth of literature out there for young people is just so like you know so great um and uh yeah i mean there's like there was there's books that i read for this that i probably would have never read otherwise yet like there are books that i think i will actually treasure forever and uh like you know i i, I tend to rate things on a scale of one to ten 
um, like when I'm as an editor. So it's like, you know, just to help me keep track of like, you know, on spreadsheets and stuff, like what did I think of this or that? And it's like, I almost never give anything a 10. You know, like, I mean, my favorite story of all time, like Flowers for Algernon, I give that a 10. You know, that some, <laughs> yeah, you know some, other, some other things here and there, I'll give a 10. I almost never give anything a 10. Um, but there was like several books that I read for this that was like, honestly, like just, this is a 10, like, you know, this is like, this like blew my mind, like knocked my socks off, you know, whatever cliche you want, um, you know. So uh, as far as trends, um, I don't know, like it was funny, there was a lot of, uh, there, there was a lot of things that I saw sort of repeated that I didn't expect, like there was a lot of World War II books um, and um, there, was a, there was a lack of people engaging with um, like technology in any meaningful way, which surprised me since it's for young people, I would have thought like there would have been a lot of books dealing with the internet or video games. And like, I don't think anything mentioned video games except maybe in passing. Um, and you know, I just did this anthology press start to play, which is, uh, um, you know, about and inspired by video games. So, so it's like, that was obviously on my mind. And, but it's like, there was, it was almost nothing. Um, I mean, nothing that I can actually remember that like dealt with video games in any meaningful way. Um, there were some that dealt with the internet, like um, one of the top ten, um, uh, Simon versus the Homo Sapiens Agenda. That one actually does deal with the internet directly. It's it, you know there's a um, there, there's sort of a, a, a you know there's like an email relationship between these two people who, who go to the same school and they don't actually know each other but they know they go to the same school and they, and and so they're they're uh, they're both uh, uh, gay boys and and you know and but they're not out and so they're having this sort of secret relationship online with each other and so obviously the internet is 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 crucial to that one um, but most of the uh, books didn't um, uh, there were some others uh, there was. Uh, uh, I Am Princess X by um, Cherry Priest. Uh, that one actually dealt with it also in a very interesting way. Um, but uh, but yeah. Um, otherwise, like trends, like um, I don't know. I mean, there was a there were several things that dealt with um, mental illness in some fashion or another, um, and including uh, several uh, very excellent ones. And um, like one of our top ten, uh, Challenger Deep uh, deals with it um, directly. And um, but there was there were several other ones as well. And so. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, those those are the only things that really come to mind. But um, and I have to be a little circumspect about what I say about things because I'm not supposed to talk about like you know the nitty gritty of the judging process. Um, otherwise, I'd just be raving about the ones that I love the most and stuff. Yeah, that's fair. Uh, I yeah. appreciate that. Um, so, are there any pieces of advice that you would give someone who is just launching a Kickstarter project for the first time? We have about two or three uh, minutes left. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, uh, as I sort of was hinting earlier, like, I mean, plan for it to take up much more of your life than you were expecting it to. Um, try to do as much work in advance as possible so that you can, um, you know, so that you can know what you're in for. Uh, or, or you know you you know you have you have all the tools at your disposal once you're actually uh, launched. Um, you know, play around with the site as much as possible so that you don't have any sort of um, uh, uh, things take you by surprise. Like for instance, like um, the when you post an update, it's like it's it's a if you copy and paste something into the update, it's like it's a little like it requires a little fussing um, when you paste it in there. So it's like you know just prepare for that. Like it's not going to be like five seconds from, from word to there, you know, and that kind of thing. Um, and, uh, yeah. So, I mean, I don't know. It's just, um, yeah. Uh, get as many people to look it over before you launch as possible so that you can make sure everything's clear because even as, even as clear as you think everything is, um, you're going to, you know, you're inevitably going to get a bunch of people who don't understand, uh, what you mean by your description of the reward goals or the stretch goals. And, um, <laughs> also, also definitely all, always have stretch goals in mind because, you know, people just always, they just, they always ask for more stretch goals. So, um, you know, and I mean, I, I understand it, but it's just like, uh, you can't get away with doing one without having like a whole litany of stretch goals. So just, just do it, you know? Um, oh, and I will say like, I mean, everybody, everybody always says like, oh, you have to do a, a, a video. And I totally understand why they say that for publishing. I don't know that it, I don't know that it is strictly necessary. I mean, the, the two destroy projects we did, we didn't have a video. Um, and they did, very well, but um, you know, if you're if you're terribly awkward and you can't even conceive of doing a video and it's just going to drive you crazy trying to figure out how to do it, like I mean, I would say like you know, just give up. Or you could do what I did with the <laughs> you could do what I did with help on my robot army and exploit cats. 
I, I actually went down to the cattery uh, where, near where we live and I shot video of a bunch of cats and then I just uh, did voiceover over it. So that way you had, some, you had something cute and adorable to look at while you're listening to me talk about my project. And, um, and, and so that, that actually kind of made it fun. But so if you can think of something like that, then do it. But, you know. So there you have it, folks. Plan in advance and exploit cats. Exactly. Um, I think that's all the time we have for today. But you can follow John Joseph Adams on Twitter or uh, check back on the site in January for his new project. Um, thanks so much for hanging out with us today. Yeah, thanks for having me.